for the next hour or so. Um, you can object later on. Can I ask one more question yeah. before you start? So do you have a preference for interrupting you for questions and comments or waiting until the end of your- uh, I would welcome interruptions. Okay, I so I will interrupt you on behalf Perfect. of the- I appreciate that. People. As an additional note on this, some of this material um, forms the backbone for my INFORMS presentation, which is in October, 24, uh, October 24th. Uh, one of the interesting things about INFORMS, because it is such a large conference, they ask that people have a presentation uploaded uh, in mid-September, which kind of forced me to take a lot of these disparate little strings I've been holding on to for the last two years and try to weave them together into something coherent. Uh, actually, even since mid-September, uh, still chipping away at this, while my broad stroke um, uh, conclusions remain the same, I've had an opportunity to run some of the analyses I'll present in a little bit more detail. Uh, so if you do find my informed presentation, you will notice that the broad strokes is the same, but some of the graphs and numbers presented may vary slightly. Uh, that is a result of just doing it in more detail. But that's my little asterisk, my little asterisk. All right, so the context of this whole sort of presentation is this idea of a multi-echelon supply chain. Now for this group, this should be familiar. What do I mean by multi-echelon supply chain? You as a consumer approach some sort of store, some sort of business, you place an order. Hopefully they give you something back in return, but of course that business does not exist on their own. They in turn have their own series of nested suppliers who have their own suppliers, who have their own suppliers, and maybe ultimately have some sort of uh, terminal supplier is actually producing the good to begin with. This is what I mean by a multi-echelon supply chain. The word echelon specifically refers to each entity in this connected chain. And when we talk about a multi-echelon supply chain, we also inevitably have to talk about bullwhip. Again, for this particular audience, I think bullwhip will be a familiar concept, but just to make sure we're all on the same page, what do I mean by bullwhip? Suppose you have a customer that has a small perturbation in their original order string. As you move further and further away from that initial perturbation, you start seeing behavior like this. You move a little bit further away. Suddenly the amplification gets a little bit bigger and the phase shift in time gets a little bit more delayed, a little bigger, a little more delayed, a little bigger, more delayed. Ultimately, succinctly, Bullwhip in this context means amplification and phase shift from that original order signal. Now we've been talking about bullwhip and I'll say this a little bit later on for a long time. One of the arguments, especially in the OM space for a while was, you know, bullwhip has been a question that's been asked, answered and explored. However, I would argue that this last year has illustrated more, uh, sort of brought bullwhip to the forefront of our thoughts uh, than it has in, in, in quite some time. Uh, in addition to um, food shortages, and then sort of explosions of inventory related to the onset of the coronavirus for the last 18 months. Uh, more directly related to that, we also have bullwhip seen directly in the development of the coronavirus vaccine itself uh, with initial shortfalls of supply followed by um, uh, incredible surpluses. And what's interesting is that these surpluses are often uh, unmatched uh, in different geographies across time. So when I talk about bullwhip, one of the things that is fascinating to me about this space is the fact that we are still talking about it and it is a persistently observable phenomenon. So one of, if you go back into some sort of the classic research in this space, uh, there is arguments that it is behaviorally oriented. We talked about Sturman's 1989 paper, which introduced the concepts of supply chain underweighting. More recently, that second, I'm realizing undated reference is uh, introducing concepts around cognitive reflection, sort of the mental models that people take when they go into a multi-echelon supply chain with complicated information uh, delivery systems and how the, the mental heuristics that they use in order to make these decisions quickly and effectively. This is sort of the behaviorally modeled approaches to this space. Uh, a little bit more recently, this 2008 paper from Decision Support Sciences introduced the idea of a model-free reinforcement learning environment in order to, to reduce cost across an inventory, multi-echelon inventory supply chain. And as I referenced briefly a little bit earlier here, this 2021 paper in INSOM uh, directly applied a, a DQN uh, to a slightly more realistic model of a multi-echelon supply chain in order to reduce costs. Now, one thing is this first half and the second half, uh, I view as two related but complementary approaches towards investigating uh, this phenomenon. And in my mind, really their, their simultaneous existence implies a gap to me. Specifically, this gap exists to contrast and compare both a model-based and model-free approach to bullwhip uh, mitigation within this space. A somewhat of a related question in there is once one takes these two different models, can we go ahead and, and uh, look at them under the context of existing behavioral literature? We have 60 plus years of discussions about the behavioral influences that lead to bullwhip. We have both model-based and model-free approaches. This literature um, should have connected tissue. Let's go ahead and find it and so, make it a little bit more explicit. 
Yeah. I'm trying to kind of see. So the w one thing is you are explaining a phenomenon using mm -hmm. a behavioral view of how people make decisions in this setting. That's kind of a Sturman's path mm -hmm. to the Bullwhip effect. And then you have these more recent uh, couple of papers you're citing that are using reinforcement learning approaches for managing supply chains, which is more of a kind of a policy question, normative question. How do you actually optimize managing the mm -hmm. supply chain? Or at least without having read those papers, that seems to me mm -hmm. to be the question, which is kind of more hardcore OM, OR type of question of, okay, what's an algorithm for managing these yes. systems? And the two are fairly distinct types of questions. They are not really addressing the same question. And you, are, you seem to be finding a, trying to find a space between these two distinct types of literatures uh, and call it a gap that there is something in between mm -hmm. because the two are not com converging. Mm -hmm. uh, but I'm asking, is there a gap that people in the, how, how do you yeah. see that gap in terms of the communities and, uh, and who care about these questions? And one thing actually that is sort of an extension to that, this, this, this question is making me think that I need to adjust some of my references in that first part right there, because you're right, the first one is descriptive. There are papers in that space that are also prescriptive that use behavioral models to suggest uh, uh, interventions. I'm thinking about specifically some of the, like the Corson Donahue papers. There's uh, one later on a reference uh, like ARC, the, the ARC system plays the beer game, in which it uses a behavioral model to suggest an, an intervention and then checks to see if that fits within the space. That is a more direct mapping between the first and the second bullet point. Okay. And that is, those are the references I really should put in this space to make okay. that more clear. Okay. Um, you are correct in that the, the subtler point, and this is that second bullet point, is what I really should be saying is those first ones where they suggest like this is, this is the mechanism by which the system occurs. Um, the second set of literature down here, the model-free approach, really doesn't require that mechanism to be explicit in their approach, like the, the, the idea of that to exist within that group. And at least from my reading, this idea of the behaviorally centric approach towards both understanding the system and uh, uh, prescribing some sort of implementation and a model free approach have begun to develop somewhat in parallel and separate from each other, sometimes informing, but a little bit more separate than I would like. And my overarching sort of uh, thesis of this particular presentation is that those two uh, uh, tracks need not be so separate and there is more connective tissue than you would otherwise imply. Um, but I completely take your point that I should use one different references in that first bullet point, and then perhaps use those first references of Sermon and a 2015 paper to support the second part of the gap is my outcome of this. Okay, so so if I'm understanding you correctly, you're saying that there is this stream of work that explains, that describes how people make decisions, but mm -hmm. there is a related stream of work that says people are behavioral, they are and uh, not fully rational, if we understand their behavioral decision rules well, we can come up with some interventions that help them make better decisions. Yes. So that's one pathway. And therefore, there is a policy question, some optimization question you can define in the space of accepting people as behavioral agents. How would we effectively deal or interact with them? And how do we design our systems so that we minimize costs, let's say. Um, and that is different from the hardcore operations question of how do we um, manage a multi echelon supply chain using mm -hmm. decision rules that are robust under various external uh, demand conditions or whatever are the constraints, which seem to be closer to the model free yeah. part of the question. So now with that, I can see these three pieces. and. You seem to be doing something that is closer to the second one, but also close to the third one. So somewhere in between second and third one. That's a good description. And to be honest, this this paper started with the first one. The first the first attempt at this was a behaviorally centric model of uh, people making decisions within the space. Given this is a model of how people make decisions in the space, what is a cost reducing strategy to implement within this space? And then it, it, it extended and grew into well. Uh, this is a behaviorally centric cost reducing strategy. There are, there are other approaches within the space that don't rely on this uh, model of, of sort of the underlying behavior. Um, 
can, can I explore that a little bit more? And in the process of doing that, uh, I feel like I'm almost stumbling across connective tissue that hasn't been highlighted in the literature previously. Um, that partially is, this is this whole idea too, and this is now beginning off, I feel like on a bit of a tangent of the division between like what one would consider to be more OR versus OM. Uh, and which and that sort of division is and this is a recorded presentation is is a is at times a personal frustration of mine because it, it it's it feels like a it's siloing within an already existing siloed space which then reduces the ability of people to communicate and learn from each other. So my my sort of larger meta goal of this is to provide at least some support to the roads that connect those two sub silos. Okay, so let's maybe so. we should. Go Getting ahead and then yeah. come back because yeah. this is the core question of what's the uh, purpose and contribution, but that we don't know that until we see more. Yes, I know, and, and that's thank you because this is uh, this is helping me because this is like again I have that overarching bigger goal and so I'll make sure I'm going in that direction. So I'm saying so if we're talking about model versus model free approaches, one thing we need to talk about is like like what sort of model we're we talking about. Classic quote here about models: all models are wrong. Some models are useful. Uh, from uh, George Box. Uh, he actually said this explicitly using that exact language in this book from uh, 1987, uh, along with uh, Draper, um, uh, sort of paraphrased uh, John Sturman, uh, used a similar expression in a paper of his from 2002. And it, essentially every system dynamics professor at some point or another says this phrase. Um, so with that being said, all models are wrong, some models are useful. We need, a, we need some sort of environmental model for both of these approaches. Mine is the beer game. For this particular audience, again, I think the beer game will be a familiar uh, place uh, to explore, but for those of you who might not be familiar with it, it's a classic inventory management uh, simulation and learning tool. It illustrates both the concepts around bullwhip itself, so uh, managers are familiar with it, and then also some somewhat deeper and more subtle um, observations around the mental models and heuristics that can lead towards um, a bullwhip. Uh, also, for those of you who hadn't had an opportunity to do this, is something that, that we do here and uh, we have done in the past in an incredibly large format uh, with hundreds of participants all doing this simultaneously. Uh, unfortunately, the pandemic happened. This is, this, is, this is clearly not meeting MIT's current COVID protocol, so we've had to move it online. Uh, however, uh, even in the online environment, we are still able to see uh, these basic concepts of inventory amplification and phase shift order ampl uh, amplification of phase shift as a result of a small perturbation in customer orders. These are two examples from a uh, recent game, uh, two separate recent games in August of this year. So ultimately what this game, uh, what this sort of project is doing in this case from a, from a modeling standpoint is you have this model of people making uh, sequential decisions in a multi echelon supply chain. And our question is what can we do uh, sort of as a cost reduction measure when we replace one of these individuals with some sort of algorithmic approach. Uh, so let's start on the modeling, uh, sorry, the behaviorally model centric side of this. Uh, this project uh, created a discrete time simulation of the beer game uh, based around the original Sturman 89 ordering rule. Small asterisks, and I'll talk about this later on in the presentation. Uh, while the rest of this presentation presupposes the Sturman 89 modeling configuration, I'm also chipping away uh, parallel similar and related modeling rules to look for significant differences in the outcomes. Uh, that includes um, the Sturman and, and Dogen uh, uh, modeling rule and a more recent one uh, forthcoming uh, in NSOM uh, by Oliva. Uh, but ultimately what this rule does is it summarizes things in broad strokes and four large modeling, modeling uh, sorry, four large parameters. People take an input of the information they receive their order they use that order to update some expectation of future orders. They then go ahead and place some order to their supply chain partner, and they have some expectation of whether or not that order will be filled and by how much. And additionally, they have some concept of a desired stock in general, of some sort of desired amount of inventory that they would like to have on hand on order in a given period of time. Given those broad stroke conditions, they then make an order each period. Um, so I actually just got ahead of myself there a little bit, just to make that more explicit. You have your uh, your folks doing this little integrated bit right there. Great. So this creates a baseline simulation of, of sort of human-like ordering in this space. This is a, a simulation of uh, four teams using ordering parameters found in the Sturman 89 paper. You can also take these teams together and come up with sort of an aggregate Sturman general agent. I mentioned this one because I'll mention the Sturman general agent at later times is sort of the baseline uh, by which I'm comparing. Uh, the actual, uh, I shouldn't say optimization, because it's really a cost minimization within this space. 
is you take these series of decisions, you fix some entity I in this space, whether it is um, you know, the retailer, uh, the wholesaler, distributor, or the factory, you leave the other three free to make decisions based upon that original ordering rule and ordering heuristic. And then for the one that you fix, you vary the values of theta, alpha, S prime, and beta within feasible bounds to minimize the overarching cost experienced by the team. So this is a straightforward um, uh, sort of uh, cost minimization based upon a deterministic model of people making uh, ordering decisions within a space. So yeah. just kind of big picture, you put one agent that you are optimizing over who's who is attempting to essentially use this heuristic to create the minimum expected um, costs for those three other agents around. That's yes. what you're doing. Yes. And why should I care about that way of doing it? Because that way of doing it, in my view, has a bunch of challenges. First of all, you're optimizing the existing decision rule mm -hmm. for humans, which is not necessarily the right decision rule for minimizing the cost of the overall uh, supply chain. Mm -hmm. It's actually not a bad heuristic with some parameters it does well for yeah. managing the supply chain, but there is no theory, there is no argument, why do I use this heuristic rather than anything else? Therefore, if you want to justify this decision mm -hmm. rule, people will say, where did you get it from? Mm -hmm. It is what people do, but why should I use the same decision rule as what people do for an optimization problem? Yes. Okay, so that's the really the primary yeah. challenge I see to this. Uh -huh. uh, and then there is a little bit of a design question on kind of uh, experimental design question of how do I optimize if I don't know the parameters of all the other people as an I'm, you're putting me in the middle of a new beer game. Yeah. I don't know what the parameters of those other people are. Uh, so what is it that I'm optimizing against? What priors are going yeah. into the uh, agent's ability to do the optimization? Thank you. Completely fair. I think part of what's getting out of that is I'm bearing the lead a little bit too much because um, the, the answer of sort of the, the overarching why comes up a little bit later on and okay. um, to be to be very honest with you I, I would love to talk about that a little bit more because the why almost becomes an indirect why not which i don't like so i, I want to talk about that in a little bit because what comes out of first of all just to make this clear for the particular uh, results i'm presenting here the other three agents are modeled using that sturman aggregate model specifically the the the, the, the average one um and i'm going to uh, again, I'm getting, I'm getting a little bit ahead of myself because I, I completely, I completely see where you're going with this. Uh, I'm actually going to hop ahead a little bit to show where that comes from. Because um, to your point, like, the, yeah, this is, I mean, it's a deterministic model. I'm, it's, it's, I'm finding these values that reduce cost um, within this space. They do reduce cost. Yay, that's great. This is but, one example. But why, why is it a deterministic model? That's a, it's deterministic in the sense that there's no. I shouldn't say deterministic. It's not stochastic. The, the, the ordering decision that is made is, is fixed in the sense that once you define those four parameters for the other four agents, if, you're, if you have fix um, any one four of those four parameters for your quote unquote cost reducing agent, it will always get the same cost for the, for the circumstances of the team. There's no noise in this particular one. There is no noise in the individual no. choices. You in, don't have those noise items in the orders. Oh, okay. So the right. orders are deterministic. Yes. And I, I so that's just wrong for the actual gear game. Yeah, it's, it is noisy. There is process noise. So why did you assume it is deterministic? Is it you think it doesn't matter the noise? The noise comes in again a little bit later on, where I take the outcome of this deterministic um, uh, okay. cost reduction and I start applying it as a ordering rule to a non-deterministic environment to okay. see under what circumstances it starts uh, no longer being. It starts, it starts um, uh, no longer reducing cost consistently. So no. if you want to do this type of thing, mm -hmm. you should do the kind of what you want the reviewers to see. Yeah. And then all of those other things would be somewhere in a, an appendix or you do it to test whether uh, removing noise makes a difference or not. Mm -hmm. And then you can just have a kind of short phrase that says, ah, 
noise actually doesn't matter, or it does matter if you get different results. Yeah. Right now, you are setting us up to critique you yeah. on an issue that you have already addressed in five slides later yeah. or somewhere. Uh, so why do that? Got it. Got it. This is this is incredibly useful. This is also the downside of staring at my own slides for way too long. Yeah. Um. Uh, and maybe you'll clarify this later, but I'm still having trouble wrapping my head around the purpose of fixing one of the agents. Mm -hmm. Um. Like, what are you trying to? What information are you trying to get from that? So the original purpose of this particular cost reduction was the idea of saying, is there is there a option in here? For us to essentially allow the other supply chain members to still behave in a human-esque fashion without us having to presuppose some sort of change in their behavior like most of the other behavioral interventions make some comment of like well what sort of training can we do what sort of information change can we hit do to, in order to reduce costs in this case my argument is that i'm gonna let the other three quote unquote people still be people using whatever heuristic that they were going to use and now given that what is what is the model of behavior for the remaining fourth agent that is still cost reducing within that space. Does it matter those. which who the agent is? A little bit. Actually, I'll get into this a little bit later on. It matters in terms of the degree of cost reduction mm -hmm. that occurs. Um, it also uh, slightly changes the uh, parameters, and that's actually a, a, a slightly. I'm, I'm actually it's a good good segue. This is one example. I'm, uh, I have all my caveats about the exact nature because the cost matter depending on us. But but just to to get ahead of it, this is to answer your question. These are some shared features of these, I should replace optimized with cost reducing agents within the space. Uh, so you end up with very low values of beta for the retailer and you end up with incredibly high values of beta for everybody else. Beta is the rate at which you take an input signal, uh, an order, and you immediately update your expectation for future orders will look like that. When you're within your supply chain, you trust the signals being sent by your supply chain partners as valid and reflective of future demand. When you're facing outside the supply chain, in this case, the retailer, you are slow to communicate that perturbation into your supply chain. So that's, and going back to this, this is one example. Um, you can see that with that first one, that theta 0 0.002 for the retailer, 1.7 for the distributor, one for the factory, hitting the top level there. And there's a comment to be made there about the wholesaler and the distributor and sort of their, their, their um, degree of control over their own universe. They're in the most decoupled position in the middle. Um, beta is a being very high or near one. This directly maps to concepts around supply chain underweighting from prior work. Uh, beta is the degree to which you essentially uh, dis or will not discount uh, the signals you have sent to your supply chain partners. Having a beta at one means that when you send a signal of 10, you expect to get 10. It might take a while, but you expect to get the signals back that you sent. Um, so, and then finally, S prime, this is a very interesting one. S prime ends up actually coming to something near the base stock replenishment value that you'd expect from a fully rational supply chain. Uh, the exceptions for this are actually when you're in uh, the middle positions where you're least stable, it ends up uh, uh, trending above that number. Uh, but in general, this was not this was not a function and assumption going into this optimization, but it did land on something near that base stock replenishment value. So this is where I would say that this is an opportunity to then reinforce existing research around the space of saying that you know we, we've said that. Trust in supply chains matters, and um, uh, supply chain underweighting is is dangerous in a supply chain. This kind of reinforces that general uh, those general observations, though within a, a small black box. But then, in my mind, this then raises the question of: Is this more generally applicable outside of this? To your point, um, sort of fully deterministic model that I built, where I'm presupposing everyone else is using the Sturman 1989 ordering heuristics. I'm also cost minimizing against those exact same heuristics. And honestly, is the use of this Sturman 89 uh, uh, behavioral ordering heuristic or really any ordering heuristic in this space strictly necessary? Uh, and what can we get from perhaps stepping away from that? Which then opens up the second question about this bond boundary between model-based and model-free approaches. That's the example that Martin et al. Uh, at our, I, I, that's a bad example for, that was for my own uh, thesis there. Uh, and then these model-free approaches, the top one is the decision support system, one that I referenced before. The bottom is the MSOM paper, and actually they have a commercial product that is spun off of that, the OPEX analytics, which has some really fun visuals if you ever want to see it. And of course, this raises the question of like how sort of permeable is this barrier between these two uh, sets of literature and approaches in the space, and in fact, does it exist? So I am not sure if why the way you're using model-based and model-free here yeah. is consistent with how I understand them in this context. Okay. So 
I would have called your what you so far presented as actually model. I don't know if it is model free exactly, but it is not using any model of how other agents are learning or acting. It mm -hmm. actually is not explicitly using that information about these agents are using this Sturman decision mm -hmm. rule. It just is optimizing blindly yeah. to them, except that it uh, is uh, always using agents that are using the average uh, Sturman uh, parameters, mm -hmm. and therefore it is exposed to a kind of a, a relatively stable environment of sorts, let's, let's, let's say. Uh, you are calling it model based because you have a heuristic for the agent that is making decisions using those heuristics. But every algorithm has a heuristic in it. That is, the reinforcement learning algorithms also have some heuristic in them. Yeah. Uh, so, in that sense, the, the, at least the canonical use of model based versus model free is not what you have shown us so far. Okay, I agree. I, so, my argument there would be observation there would be that there is a model that limits the feasible range that the agent can make that has a model of its own decision making based upon inputs and outputs that's baked into that heuristic to your point there is in that optimization minimization there is no overarching model of the environment in which it exists that yeah. then breaks away from the idea of, of model based versus model free now when i get to the model free um uh areas here you start getting into model you, like not like so you end up getting uh, like DQ and the similar structures or like whatever where they have a, a built-in model of either the physics of the overarching system in which they exist yep. or occasionally have a model of the physical ranges of parameters that they can take yep. and in that sense I, I see what you mean in the sense that the, the there is no explicit model of the environment in which it exists right, baked around it Okay. That's what they call model based, model free versus model based approaches. At least in the reinforcement learning literature, the, the question is whether you have a model of, of the physics of the dynamics, mm -hmm. or you have to learn those physics as well from your interaction with the environment. Mm -hmm. If you have a model of the physics of the environment, then you have a model based approach, and that usually saves you uh, some computation, quite a bit of computation potentially. That's the distinction there. Here, you don't have a model of environment in the decision rule built into that decision rule. It's just mm -hmm. a decision rule you're optimizing its parameters mm -hmm. uh, and you're not using any information about. Okay, I, I, will, I will reassess maybe my language around that then. Because I think there's something still to be said about the idea of having a behaviorally grounded heuristic that can be mapped to existing behavioral literature that is sort of defining the order rule that someone's making versus this other decision, which I'm going to get into this other agent, which also doesn't necessarily have a model of its of its environment when it starts out. But then at the same time, we don't have the ability to also probe the why of the decisions that it's making. And so maybe I'm not using the right labels then. Maybe, but uh, in that, is, so you could go with different ways of doing an optimization. Mm -hmm. Right now you have just, you're optimizing over a bunch of parameters on the left-hand side on the model base. On the model free version, you are optimizing using a different process uh, of a reinforcement learning or something. Uh, but within that reinforcement learning optimization, you could have different levels of information about how agents mm -hmm. are reflected. That is, you may have other agents uh, underlying parameters being something that you learn or you do not learn. And if you're learning those, you have a model of those other agents. So you could have this model based versus model free. Yeah. When you are going into the space you're currently calling model free. Uh, okay. I think, okay. Okay. I'm, I'm going to circle back around to that because I still think. Yeah, let's, let's go ahead. Uh, I, I don't, yeah. I still think there's something here that, but I want to figure out that I'm not distracting with the wrong terminology then. And I, I think then maybe yeah. I'm not. I'm not talking but about also it. try to be comfortable if there is nothing there so okay. um so yeah this, this i think i this is next few slides are a little bit of a background on reinforcement learning as a concept you have an agent interacts and makes some uh, action with your environment um in turn the environment is updated you receive some the agent receives some sort of new uh information about the new state of the world that it's in and also along the same time some sort of reward uh, based upon um, that that new state that it finds itself in. Um, 
So this is the perception action learning loop that shows up in literature uh, repeatedly. Um, additionally, uh, the model-based agent. Um, so when I talk about this is the idea of the model versus model free, and now we can, we can uh, this now, these slides, um, I think still apply, but I think now, and you go back and revisit some of my framing around the earlier parts, this whole idea of the model-based agent has some knowledge of its environmental dynamics. Yeah. It might have some ability to predict the outcome based upon the action it's taking and thus cut down its, its, its action space. Uh, and actually right there, a priori has some knowledge about the transition probabilities within your overarching um, sort of Markov decision process that you have um, versus a model three, you have no pre-existing knowledge of the, of the shape of that space. You don't know what your transition states are. Um, and then same thing doesn't necessarily estimate the probabilities, but rather estimates rewards given your states. You actually have no guarantee under some of these model three approaches you, you have, uh, some of them uh, don't necessarily even require that you have a full Markov decision process with full transitions between the states. It doesn't really matter in this case because what you really care about is the reward given the combination of the action and the state. Um, yes. So kind of existing model free approaches. This is the 2021 paper in INSOM. Uh, uh, Apply a DQN network directly actually to a model of the beer game. In doing so, introduce uh, sort of some alternative ways to approach this uh, complex decentralized decision making system uh, and ways of training uh, different agents simultaneously. Um, it also introduced an interesting idea for um, uh, uh, accruing rewards in each time frame and how to pull those rewards between individuals. Uh, in my mind, that's the current sort of state of the art uh, at this point, uh, especially applying. Um, DQN to this particular space. It also introduces DQN as, as a viable uh, option for a model-free approach. Um, some key difficulties: uh, you don't actually the, the full state information is not truly known. That was the 2008 Decision Support Sciences paper. The shortcut, short, I shouldn't say shortcut. The assumption they made there was that the full state was known to every entity. That's not the case in the beer game. Our rewards are communal, not known until the end. Um, this is a, a, an interesting observation missing from the 2021 paper. Um, the current state matters. Uh, as much as, if not uh, as one specific action, the whole idea of a bullwhip is you're in an inventory crisis in action and, and a very small perturbation from sort of a rational decision-making can, can, can induce these large swings in order behavior. Um, and also this whole idea that the DQN, especially in noisy environments, can be over-optimistic. This is a function of how the DQN is kind of built, uh, especially later on when you're in pure exploit, uh, exploitation mode. Um, you start ignoring what are technically uh, close to equivalent outcomes um, and start overestimating the value of relatively similar outcomes uh, based upon small perturbations in the, in the opening state. So possible solutions within this one. Uh, one is this idea of, of uh, uh, prior action uh, memory window, uh, the use of an order plus action space. This is the whole idea that this is, you have infinite, this is just suggested by the 2001 paper. You have infinite order possibilities. One way to kind of reduce the size of that order space is to instead say that I'm going to order relative to the last order I received as opposed to assigning a Q value to every specific uh, possible order string. Um, and then this is the big one, break up the state and action Q networks and then combine them together. This was suggested in this 2015 paper, dueling network architectures, uh, which um, I apply within within uh, what I ended up building. Just uh, yeah. one slide back, I'm, I'm trying to understand. So these guys are model free in the sense that they don't, they completely ignore the dynamics of beer game and mm -hmm. they don't care about what other agents are doing in the sense of, as they don't have a model of what the yeah. other agents are doing. Yeah, they have no knowledge of their- But they're doing the same thing as you are doing. That is they put one uh, simulated agent in the middle of, uh, for mm -hmm. three other human agents and then try to optimize or not? They put one, similar, they put one simulated agent in the middle of a scenario that is either um, base stock ordering agents or uh, Sturman 89 uh, developed um, agents and then train against that. Okay. And uh, then they compare it with human, actual human subjects as well? They, uh, in theirs, they have a limited test against real human subjects. Their primary one is, again, against. Um, Another model of Sturman 89 ordering agents and base stock ordering agents, but not actual. There, there's, there's there's a there's sort of a hand wave reference to a, a test, and then also they point towards their commercial product that lets okay. you play with it. Um, their primary point, the primary thrust of their paper is specifically these modifications to the DQN to adjust um, how the reward is calculated, which then allows them to break away from the assumptions that were made in that prior uh, 2008 paper. Is kind of their 
ultimately it's a little bit different from some of the earlier preprints, but that's how it finally landed at Intel. Um, really quick, so what actually I ended up building is uh, the state transition function is based upon the, the functional form of the beer game that was developed in the model-based optimization, model-based asterisk in the corner there. Uh, the environment itself uh, allows simultaneous training across all positions versus the MSOM paper, they trained sort of each position separately. Um, uh, it's made the environment which is in is a randomly drawn uh, group of teams from the 1989 Sturman paper. Uh, the time horizon is also random between 36 and 104 uh, to avoid the, the thing kind of memorizing when it's going to get to the end of this end of the simulation. Um, and then has the ability to have noisy realization of the order decisions. Uh, the actual results I'm going to show you, I'm realizing you need to correct this, are for a version of this model that was not trained against noisy order decisions in order to make it a little bit essentially one for one for the comparison I want to make. Rather than training it where there's noisy realizations of the order decisions, it's trained against a, um, um, uh, once you randomly assemble the teams, there's no noise added to their orders. Uh, it is possible for me to go down that route. Uh, I purposefully tied my hand behind my back because I think it makes the results more interesting. Uh, the architecture itself is this dual DQN structure. Uh, this is this idea that you take um, your, your, uh, your network and you have a separate Q value you're keeping track of for the state of the system versus the individual actions and you combine them back together again. This is specifically to overcome this idea of uh, over enthusiastic assessment of your Q value and um, observation specifically within this context of bullwhip, the state that you're in matters almost as much as the decision you make. Um, and actually uh, greatly um, increase both the, uh, reduce the training time from my own experience training time and um, the quality of decisions that are being made at the end of the day. Um, so quick note about dueling dual QN. I've already said this a little bit. This is just super quick. You have a Q table that has a, a habit of being over optimistic in certain Q values. So then you separate it out into this idea of keeping track of the value in the action state and combine them back together again. Over the course of keeping track of the value state, be part of the process of this aggregator is it actually subtracts out the average, the mean score that you would expect from any particular action. The result is it somewhat normalizes the progression of the uh, assessment of the Q values over time. So you don't have this one particular Q value that just gets reinforced over and over and over and over and over again as the right decision. Uh, additionally, the actual exploitation versus exploration algorithm chosen to my particular build is this combination of a Boltzmann prop policy and a greedy policy, which encourages exploration for longer in this horizon. Um, just as that's a, a minor note for this. Um, so I feel like I'm kind of repeating this again. Now with back to our old framework, our environment, I have my environment of my nested ordering structure that comes directly from the previous environment. There's uh, some reward or some observation of state, sorry, so is fed into our dual network. The dual network um, updates with a new, like a no sort of running window of the last four actions it's taken. And then it updates its action. So uh, yes. you mentioned that you have a model of the environment in the sense that it knows it is running the beer game, so it can simulate the state transition. Yeah. So uh, for the environment, does that mean it also simulates for the agents, the other other actors? Yeah. Uh, so, and when it simulates for other actors, does it use the baseline Sturman rule, or does it use something else? So this one uses the baseline Sturman rule. I have flags, so let me use about two, right now, two other similar decision rules. Um, I'm gonna talk about this at the end, but that's one of my next things I'm, I didn't have time for this presentation, is to look if any of these results materially change when putting it in that in those different environments. My initial uh, outcome so far is that it's act, is not really. It, it's it, the actual individual decisions that are made are largely similar and some of the later stuff I'm gonna talk about in terms of the outcome of different noisy environments is broad strokes the same, but that is a question like, for example, there's the, the Sturman and, and Dogen paper in which you have the ability for your other agents to update that S prime over time. The downside, and there is real decision-making, but the downside is that particular set of decision rules presupposes a, um, a uh, constant and uh, stable input signal. Uh, which then, so then transitioning it to this environment, uh, I had to make some assumptions. Uh, some of the parameters no longer make sense if you, the moment you have an input that's not stable, it presupposes, I, like, I've been told ahead of time, a priori, the order will always be always be four, and yet bullwhip still happens. And so then once bullwhip does happen, you have to then update your expectations for how the people around you will change their decisions, but you always have this constant in the back of your mind that I know the real answer is four. Uh, in this case, 
in this environment, that, that parameter loses meaning. So in translating that order rule to this environment, it had to take a step back and make some assumptions. So the Sturman order rule is just the one that was easiest to kind of put in here without having to trim anything out of it. That's fine, uh, but the Sturman decision rule has these four parameters. You are starting with the baseline of those parameters for the agents. One possibility is to keep it at the baseline level. The other is to look at the actions and uh, orders each agent has made, and based on that, fine tune those parameters, essentially estimate those four parameters mm. uh, for each agent as you see more of their actions. Yes. Uh, are you doing this latter one as well? or you're just doing the fixed? Right now, just the fix where right now I'm allowing the, 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 this neural net to discover its own path forward uh, through the space. Like in the sense that these, this other environment is forms the transition rule when you get to a state. So when the agent walks in there, makes a decision of I'm gonna order six today, given the parameters that are already fixed in the space, then that gives you a, a transition that says that now, given that you've ordered six, I now know that everyone else is going to order this. Every all the various parameters are going to update. Now we're in this new state of the world over here. Um, agent, here's your here's your reward. Here's a new state of the world sort of idea. So that's in that sense, the agent really has no knowledge that the rest of these agents exist. It has no knowledge that that they use these four these four rules. All it knows is it put out an order of six, and now it's in this. Kind of new state of the world in terms of what its observation space is, which is where all the supply chain is and, and uh, what the costs are that were incurred. If that makes sense, I feel like I'm not explaining it quite right. I'm not just sure if how much it is that it is using the information about the underlying state transition uh, and about the other agents' decision rules. Uh, mm -hmm. So in that sense, it might be more model free. Or is it really model based? I mean, you're calling it model free, but yeah. I then you explained. I thought you you have a model here that helps with the uh, simulations, and therefore it is model based. But now I'm hearing maybe it is model free. So you know, this this one is in it might be strictly model free because the, the agent itself has no knowledge of, of what is happening around it. Okay. All it is given is observation reward. Okay, yeah. got it. Yes. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. That one. That that one. That one. I feel like that. That, that one. I have. I have clear cut, which is which is good. Um, Quick question. Quick question, James. It's Ed here. Ed Anderson. Um, you said earlier that uh, you were assuming, if I understood this right, that the external input would be four, and then all of a sudden it shifts to eight, and that um, is going to cause disturbances. Okay. Yeah, so that I didn't, you're right, I didn't mention that here as well. For this okay. case, the so, training. Um, and, and yeah, I've got a point here. Um, you know, real world, those orders won't be continually four, even when, you know, they'll be stochastically stable, say that the mean is four, mm -hmm. but yeah. they're still going to flutter around that four with some variability. As opposed to, like you said, you know, well, somehow it's got to distinguish that from when you end up at eight, you know, which is sort of like what's going on with COVID now where the base demand has jumped up by 50% approximately. Um, if you're gonna get to that later, that's cool, but just let me know. No, I appreciate that. So um, that's one of the caveats with uh, at least that, what I, what I was calling the model-based approach at the very beginning of the day, is it kind of that S prime uh, number presupposes a stable, um, a stable order signal and the fact that it's it's sort of centering around 36 implies that it's more or less memorizing and it's jumping up to, to, to eight with a four unit delay in time. Uh, there, there's another bit of this that I'm chipping away at where I have, a, I have an autocorrelated signal that slowly moves its way through time. Um, part of the question there is, uh, and a separate earlier version of this also uh, just injected a stationary but incredibly like sort of noisy input signal. Um, that initial Cost reduction, uh, as long as the input stable, as long as the input signal is is long run stationary, is still cost reducing versus if it was absent. The moment it is no longer long run stationary, it is not necessarily cost reducing. So the opportunity there is to then come up or inject a different uh, behavioral model that allows for an unstationary um, sort of input signal 
uh, which is in that sermon and Dogan uh, paper, which I've been chipping away at. Uh, but Got for it. the sake of this particular presentation, the training environments for, for everything uh, have a step input function matching uh, the sort of classic beer game, uh, partially because that's the environment under which those models of real humans making decisions was drawn to begin with, uh, to reduce sort of the variability in that space. But that's an excellent, an excellent point. Like the, the stationarity of all this is a gigantic um, yellow marker in the top corner of a lot of this. Okay, got it. That's reasonable. Um, um, this right here, sort of Donahue. Yeah. At some point, you're probably going to compare with Donahue's work. You will want to think about having some randomness there. Yes. But anyway, thank you. Oh, thank you. That's great. Um, I was going to say this. This is something else. I, I'm going to say model informed, model free approach. This is my asterisk here. Is like I keep saying model free approach in the sense that that the agent itself is a model is model free. But the choices that were made in even building this model and building and kind of building this model free approach were informed by the observations that came out of the earlier model based approach. Uh, specifically, like even the, the, the training environment itself is built off the physics of, of that. The order plus action space um, is somewhat informed by the high beta observations from the beginning point. So you could have an infinite space and say that, okay, I'm going to let my agent choose between um, negative 100 and, or sorry, not negative 100, zero and 100 units. Instead, what mine says is that I'm going to I'm going to go ahead and say that I'm going to pin it in a window around the incoming order. So to a degree, my agent's decision is still ultimately pegged to the incoming order that it's receiving at the end of the day. Part of this it makes the problem tractable. Uh, you can then move in the spaces you want, uh, but even the choice that choice in my mind maps a little bit to that that theta observation before the window to observation space is informed by this idea of, of beta being high and you remember the order that you that you gave. Uh, providing this um this entity with an ability an observation space that included a repetition of the prior four uh states of the world uh was incredibly helpful in both reducing the uh training time and increasing the performance of the final agent uh that number four when increased to like five six seven eight didn't matter too much when placed in two uh had less an effect and that number four in this case matches the uh, amount of information delay Within your within your system, a couple of observations. There. This also is a, a practice that's been highlighted in some prior uh, literature of DQNs and similar uh, spaces, including the 2021 Insom so, paper. So I'm just not clear what it does actually. What is an observer windowed observation space in the reinforcement learning? What's so this do? It's a repetition. So the full observation space that the agent is exposed to is a is a um, what what I would consider to be a single sort of snapshot of the universe as it sees. Its observation that it actually is seeing is that single snapshot, and then it's a it's a um, a, um, a tensor that then goes back x number of repetitions of the prior few snapshots that it saw of that of that period of time. And so in this case, that is it's a set of four. So when you move on, the bottom, last one's dropped from the observation, the new one's slapped on the front. Um, so I need to hop into a little bit. That's, uh, just, yeah. Um, so this is an example of an application of that DQN to the wholesaler position. Uh, this is just for one example using, again, uh, no, no noise injected, just, at, uh, so yeah, at least it works um, in broad strokes. So now this is, I wanna be careful with time to now, this is the part that I think is really getting to some of the parts that I wanted this presentation to really emphasize, and I hope we'll answer some questions about the overarching whys of a lot of this. So this idea of probing the boundary between these two spaces, um, and in doing so, my approach to this was essentially to take these two agents, one built out of this DQN structure, the other one that is um, a cost-reducing uh, model of human decision within that space, and put it in um, somewhat increasingly caustic environments and then see how they behave within that space. So what this was done was um, more details, uh, essentially randomly assemble those other three players. So both um, uh, from all of the different teams that I had data for, um, for each time now start injecting noise in the order that was placed in that case. Uh, and then do that essentially uh, 500 repetition, repetitions, um, both with and without that entity, um, and then move it along the supply chain to take a look at the outcomes of that. And then specifically the sigma for this, it's a zero mean uh, normally drawn noise signal. Uh, the sigma is between zero and 15. Um, that's chosen primarily because once you, when they got to 15, that's when, you know, that's when it started leveling out at least a little bit. And we'll see, we'll see it's truncated as, you know, it's kind of have a negative order. Yeah, 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 yeah. The order signal is negatively truncated. Um, the whole order signal, yeah. 
So yeah, your entire order could be blown out of water. So this this is this is the numeric. This is this. I'm actually going to skip ahead a little bit because I, I present this differently. I think a little bit later on, um, in a more interesting way. Uh, specifically, this. So let's go ahead and first. This is the relative performance of the two. So this is saying how much more cost reducing was the DQN versus the model free approach. Okay. Let's look now at the two extreme ends of the supply chain, at the retailer and the factory. So in this case, what you can go ahead and see there is that, especially for the factory, as you move to more and more sort of noisy environments, the value of the DQN uh, increases. However, I'll say point this out that for relatively um, less noisy environments, the actual model-based approach is consistently better. Uh, and even if you look at the retailer, uh, the argument there, and I'll, I'll, I'll support this more directly, um, the DQN is more or less um, in the same as what you end up getting from using the, the model-based heuristic approach. In the middle of the supply chain, it's a little bit different. You're in a slightly more decoupled environment. Um, it's a little bit harder to manage to begin with. Uh, and in that case, well, at very small levels of noise, the DQN does perform better for uh, the position of the wholesaler. In general, uh, the model-based heuristic approach does better until you start to get into more and more noisy environments. Actually stated more directly, if we just go ahead and do a linear fitting assist and take a look at our T-stats, the retailer, the difference between the DQ and the retailer is in fact flat. Same thing, the actual, not, well, not on here, the constant is also statistically insignificant from, from, um, from zero, uh, indistinguishable from zero. For everything else though, uh, there is a, a clear uh, positive slope for this curve. As you get into noisier and noisier environments, the DQ in, uh, uh, continues to be more and more valuable in that space. Um, some more practical examples, if we look specifically at um, some of the, the runs of the beer game that were online from August of 2021, um, this is kind of the, the median uh, contribution to costs by position. I should state I removed th the three extreme outliers from this data set. Amongst the three outliers of this data set, two, the distributor was above and beyond responsible for the costs of like 90 plus percent of the costs, and one, uh, the factory was responsible for 90 plus percent of the cost, just to give you a slightly so more. more the, the scale for your graph on the left hand side, uh, th those numbers are kind of what sh what's the baseline I should compare it with? How much each method saves compared to no intervention? And then uh, how much we are seeing extra benefit here for one versus the other? Yeah, I, I, you're right. And I, sh I should really, because this is a point scale and that's not clear at all. So, what that is essentially saying is if the if the, uh, what's a good example here? If the uh, DQN reduced costs by 50% versus the baseline and the model based for that same sigma value reduced costs by 30%, the number on this graph would be 20. Got it. So, so this is percentage. Yes. Yeah, I should. I should percentage. I should have yeah, changed that, change that scale. Okay. That's confusing. Uh, okay, so a negative number, sorry, a negative number might just mean that DQN has increased the cost. Yes, it could. Compared to baseline on having no agent. Yes. Okay. And in fact, if I go back here a little bit, especially for the factory, um, I kind of, I kind of, oh my, why is this? Why did we freeze? There we go. Uh, so this is now we're now inverting the the. Um, uh, yeah, we're now we're now inverting the scales a little bit. Yeah. So actually, for the. Factory position specifically, the DQN was actually cost additive until you got into an extremely noisy environment versus not having it there, just having a baseline model run. Um, so that's a, just a crappy DQN. For, for one position. <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah. Uh, but this is, and for, yeah, for me at least, this is, this is sort of the outcome here that I want to emphasize is that sort of the, the value of one approach for, versus the other is a function of this of this noise that you inject into your system. Um, and uh, specifically that they, at the end of the day, they, they complement each other. One is not necessarily a better approach than the other. It depends upon what you're, what exactly uh, you're looking for. Um, and additionally, what I thought was interesting is this behavioral model-based approach, which was trained in a non-noisy environment, a deterministic environment, is still surprisingly robust when you start applying it to noisier and noisier ordering outcomes. Um, so in this case, it wasn't until we got relatively high in, in, in that uh, sigma uh, value that this thing starts being cost additive, especially for that wholesaler position. And additionally, if we go back and look at the DQN, where this one starts to break down, the other one starts to shine a little bit more. Uh, so from sort of to wrap this all up and for the sake of time, uh, I, I leave this slide, this, the wording of the slide uh, consistently for different versions of this presentation to remind myself of what one of the overarching goals of this project was for me. 
this idea of letting people be people, this uh, both of these optimization or cost reduction routines uh, goes about without imposing any additional constraints on the behavioral ordering of the human partners within the system. I make no assumptions about adjusting the other people around me other than me send, sending my own order signals uh, within the space. In terms of limitations, uh, I view this as empirically grounded, but certainly not empirically verified. I would love to do this uh, an actual test with this in, in place. Um, there are real concerns about integration and real supply chains. Uh, we talk about integration and cost sharing. Um, often, especially when looking at individual traces of runs of this, um, especially the retailer side, and you start looking at the costs that are incurred by individual supply chain partners within the space, and you start getting some interesting observations around you know, the retailer incurring more cost in the short run in order to reduce the cost of the overarching system in the long run. Um, so this does raise some, some further questions about integration costs and how you, you assign that. And then to, the, to, to Ed Anderson's comment, some other comments in the room here too, uh, this is all based around an environment built around a stationary order signal drawn from the Sturman 89 paper. There are other behavioral models for how people make decisions in the space that are related. There's an opportunity to do this work using those as a baseline and in turn uh, double check that some of these assumptions still hold and aren't just dependent upon that particular uh, environment. Um, so this is kind of the conclusion here. Uh, this is my, my highlight of like um, this craving compared model-based model-free algorithmic interventions to mitigate full width. The model-based intervention is directly interpretable in the context of existing uh, sort of best practices that again, the idea of uh, trust your supply chain uh, be slow to incorporate noise from outside your supply chain. Remember your signal, your order signals. Um, the model free uh, intervention uh, is using this dual DQN structure, which is uh, relatively novel within this particular space. This was not used in the 2021 paper. And Ensom, I think, has value uh, whenever you have this idea that your environment matters or your state matters as much as your actions or even more so. Uh, and then again, neither intervention approach. Uh, has any uh, reliance on changing the ordering behavior of the supply chain partners in which you exist. Um, I have a follow up question that comes from all of this uh, that's in the back of my mind and is often decided for future work is sort of does it matter if people know that they're dealing with an algorithm or not? Uh, so the empirical test of this would be very interesting, but then furthermore, even the structure of that test, uh, there's a sub question to be asked about. Um, whether or not uh, the outcomes vary based upon if you are assuming you're talking to a human or not, because all of these prior behavioral models uh, were people interacting with people, not people acting, interacting with machines. And some prior work has implied that that might matter. Um, thank you. Kind of sped up there at the end, but that's the, uh, that's where I am. Love, love additional commentary. I got a few pages of notes here, but I'd love some more. I have just a clarifying question, if yeah. you can go back a few slides. Just in the interpretation of the graph, I, I was like slower to follow um, when you were, yeah, right here, ah, sorry. when you were comparing the DQN. So can you explain the, um, the y-axis? Yes, sorry, and I definitely need to clarify that. So what this is showing is, simple, is the relative uh, cost reduction that the DQN approach got versus the model-based approach, and it's a simple subtraction of the two. Okay. So in that case, you run this for 500 runs with noisy ordering signals. One is simply a model of, uh, of those humans making ordering decisions within the space, run 100 times with, or 500 times with that noise parameter to get a sort of an average baseline cost. Run it 500 times again with the same uh, noise signal and the same um, seed. Only this time um, you put in your agent. The orders will be different after that very first round because even though you're doing the same noise seed, the moment that the order is different, then everything spikes off. So I can do it 500 times. You then compare the cost that was incurred on average with and without the agent. So let's say the DQN reduced your cost versus the baseline by let's just say 10% in this case. Then I do the same thing again with instead of the DQN, you do it with that uh, cost reducing model of an agent both with and without and present within that space. Uh, and let's say that that one reduced the cost by 30%. In that case, the DQN did 20 points worse than the model-based approach. So I would plot this as a negative 20 on gotcha. this graph. Gotcha, gotcha. So what this is essentially saying, at least how I view this graph is, as you get more and more noise in your signal, the value of the DQN increases. Mm -hmm. The notable exception being the retailer where it's more or less flat. Um, to Shear's point, something that was interesting within this space is that the 
a wholesaler, especially the the um, the Sturman model based cost reduction version of it very quickly um, goes off the rails and you start losing value uh, from that point. Uh, but the DQN is relatively stable. Uh, the inverse is somewhat true for the for the retail, for the factory, um, which could be a function of the structure of the DQN itself. Um, is that helpful? Yeah, that's helpful. Um, any questions from the Zoom? I didn't see any raised hands or. There's none that I can yeah, ask questions. <laughs> I already asked too many. So, I, I mean, maybe more giving some comments. So, big picture, it's a little bit too much focused on beer game the way you are putting this, or even multi echelon supply chains, mm -hmm. than a bigger theoretical question. And that makes kind of how far you can go, that limits how far you can go. Okay. So I think the big picture, there is essentially behavioral OM has all these models of how people make decisions that are arguably more realistic uh, than what a rational choice model would be saying. And then the question is, in these settings, how could we improve performance? Mm -hmm. One approach is come up with just some basic simple heuristics qualitatively or show more information about mm -hmm. your supply line because we know people are underestimating supply line and things like that. Then the next approach is actually come up with a set of um, heuristics that are how people actually can act in these settings they use and give them useful tips based on their own heuristics. So that's what your model-based uh, algorithm, algorithm is trying to do. Mm -hmm. And then the third is come up with a much better algorithm that incorporates how people are making decisions uh, into its yeah. response function and then tries to come up with a response that maximizes the overall system performance. So in that sense, what you are doing is a single comparison of options two and three. Okay. And the, these two options, however, are very different in their nature. So option two is, okay, let people be, be people, mm -hmm. but we are going to recommend something to these people. So our recommendation should enhance the system performance, not only that individual's performance. Yes. So let us now run this optimization of the parameters of the heuristic people use, because that's the only thing they understand uh, in a simplified world, uh, but tell them a, a recommendation that really helps with the overall system performance. Mm -hmm. If that was your selling of the model-based approach, then yes, that is a reasonable way of doing it. Okay. But that is one. So, and I'm, I don't know even if anybody has done that in the literature. So, you could actually make that a point, a, a selling point that, okay, people have qualitatively talked about this, but let people be people uh, and give them behaviorally useful recommendations means that we need to optimize as the structure of heuristic they use mm -hmm. to the task at hand. I'm using the beer game as an example of operationalizing this idea. Mm. Then there is the third option, which is, no, let's put an algorithm mm. and let that algorithm do whatever it can do to improve the system performance and not constrain ourselves with the heuristic that uh, people might be using. Okay. Then your contribution is to come up with a something around that algorithm that adds value to what already exists. Now, given that there is already a paper that is published uh, that does that with a version of this DQ1 uh, algorithm, you actually have to have an edge over that uh, prior piece yeah. to have a selling point on that front. Otherwise, it's kind of already done and it is not such a big uh, topic that people would not have. Uh, so then there is a question of what can you do on, and then there is, a, 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 in terms of design, there is a question whether having these, comparing these two approaches even makes sense, Yeah. because mm -hmm. they are of different natures. One is, okay, 
I am essentially helping a human decision maker being a better team player. The other is I'm trying to design an algorithm that improves systems performance. Mm -hmm. And they're kind of apples, apple and orange. So comparing them is just not an easy way of doing it. Uh, so my taste would have been yeah. either go to the second or third one. I'd yeah. probably go to the third one because the second one, uh, maybe it is not done before that much, but also is not that, uh, yeah. I mean, contribution is not that long, right? I, that's my reaction. The third one, however, the way you currently have it, I think is missing all the value that the third approach can have because the value of the third approach is in a model-based uh, approach. Model-based in the sense that it is cognizant of the heuristics people typically use in that setting. That's the mm -hmm. whole point of building on behavioral operations and mm -hmm. saying, Given that behavioral operations allows us to estimate these heuristics or quantify them, identify them, mm -hmm. then we can design better algorithms. Yeah. So then your design of comparing the current model free DQN with a model based DQN, which significantly outperforms this model free DQN, if it was the case that it significantly yeah. outperforms it, would be a strong test or a useful okay. contribution that says, Guys, this is the value of behavioral operations. You come yeah. up with he these heuristics that then can synergize with the algorithm that sits on the side and can essentially significantly improve upon what would be a model free view of the world for algorithms to improve system performance. And I think that is a nice okay. contribution. Okay, so no, I, I, this is this is nice. This is collapsing together a couple couple things in my brain. Because to your point, the, the part two or the, of the three ones that you laid out, the option two, that was essentially the thrust of the uh, thesis paper I put together for this group, and that's kind of where it, it stopped at that point. Um, part of this project so far has, quite frankly, been learning and growing pains about seeing exactly where the state of the art of the sort of programs and not programs methods are and how to incorporate it into the space because it's not like I mean, half the things that you can find for supporting else is like let's figure out how to play an Atari game. Yeah. Like, that's not that's not what we're talking about here. Um, that's interesting and helpful. So this is this actually the big thing is the apples to oranges conversation is forcing me to reassess some of my own assumptions here. Like this for me is still interesting of this idea of like these approaches where where, where do they where are they complementary to each other but to your point what i'm hearing from that is that essentially i'm saying that the two things i'm comparing are not the appropriate things to be comparing within this space draw a line in the sand after just to what you know whatever you know where i'm going with this draw a line in the sand after that slide where i say here's here's theta beta blade blade, 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 blade. i can maybe draw the line back in again of like, well, my overarching architecture is informed by some, some of that material, great. But then the big thing is this structure right here, actually, this is a good slide to stop on, this structure right here, the actual nature of my um, uh, uh, Q, DQN that I, I, so that I put in here might have some sort of seed of that Sturman 89 rule or some other decision rule, some other heuristic of like, we assume that I'm, I, the, 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 the DQN assume I am in an environment with these other, agents making these decisions. Therefore, if I make this choice and I'm in position number four, they are likely going to do X, Y, and Z. Yeah. yeah. Okay. That's what model based is. Yes. Yeah. And that's where the value of knowing about these agents' mm -hmm. heuristics can show up in creating DQNs that are more focused, that don't need as much data that yeah. uh, and can come up with more effective decisions. Helpful. Yes. Um, can you help me understand how you would, how one would operationalize, or if one could in the real world, that third option of intervening um, with an algorithm and not really constraining ourselves, as you said, to human behavior heuristics? Yes, yeah, so your point. I think I think the the this so this is an interesting point because I think that the practical value of actually that option two is more clear. I'm reinforcing these ideas of that, you know, there's a whole paper over here that says 
trust in supply chains matters. Whole paper over here that says that the origins of some of the these oscillations are supply chain underweighting. Hey, look, you as a person, supply chain person, like trust matters. Trust the signals you receive. Act on the signals you receive. Great, that 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 works. For this, this is actually my hesitation because one of the reasons I even started down this project was a suspicion that people were sort of over applying some of these architectures in interesting ways simply because you know they're interesting and, and different and you're losing you're stepping away from the ability to 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 open the hood and sort of really ask the question of why is it doing the things it's doing and then you also then lose the ability to lift and land it outside of the environment which existed because you can't make those observations about trust and, and supply chain underweighting the rest um so the folks, at least that 2021 paper, there, for them, it was directly developing a commercial product that exists in a supply chain, that exists within the context of a supply chain to, um, to help uh, provide alternative recommendations for order quantities. Um, that then, for me, though, leads to a whole other series of questions that I don't have a good answer for, but I would love to spend a lot of time diving into in the future of, you know, human algorithm uh interface and you know how does the algorithm influence the people's ordering decisions and how does that in turn that feedback loop between the ordering decisions affect future iterations of the training on that algorithm um so i don't have a good I answer Arya's question is yeah. this answer is there are tons of ordering decisions that happen algorithmically like mm -hmm. amazon doesn't have a million people making right. decisions on every sku it has an algorithm that is making those decisions if James's work could show there is a way for so Amazon to account that. for the fact Amazons of the world to account for the mm -hmm. fact that the two sides have human decision makers as well in many cases, then they could actually improve everybody's mm -hmm. overall performance. And I think that is actually exactly what OM should be doing. That's yeah. kind of what OM has always been focused on. And now the point of behavioral OM is here that if you do the estimation of human decision making well you can do the optimization of the overall system much better and i think that doesn't come true if you just have a model free dq one because it is ignoring human decision making heuristic anyway uh, so if they were any kind of algorithm for other agents dq and performance would be kind of similar in a sense James, this is Ed again. Just if you're going to go that way, which I think makes really good sense, bear in mind that another factor you have to consider when investing or modeling agents is that now there is there are a lot of firms that are actually investing in personal relationships, whatever that means. They're um, was shown in the early stages of COVID that, uh, for example, when there were shortened allocations or when allocations occurred, they tended to be put towards companies that all their things equal had better one-on-one -on relationships, one -on -one relationships between the suppliers and purchasers. So it's just something to think about because uh, you're talking about trust here. Yeah. Actually, to that point, you could kind of make the argument that you have to, you could benefit from this algorithmic support mm -hmm. to actually re reinforce trust because yeah. you are doing a better job optimizing the system performance. So you are not triggering your supplier or your customer yeah. by giving crazy, by doing crazy things yeah. that violates trust. So as such, you are building that trust and part of that building of trust is using an algorithm that accounts for how people react to your actions. I'm sure you said, so I write my notes in these little notepads and then I move them around spatially based upon like what they like what they were talking about. Um, so yeah, this is good. Um, there's a comment in the oh. Sorry, Cecilia. No, I'm just chuckling. Okay. <laughs> um, there's a comment in the chat from Sam Allen, which seemed to be similar to what Hajir just asked. But Sam, if you want to elaborate on that, um, I'm sorry I didn't see it until just now. That's okay. I was a little bit late. Um, but yeah, so my question, James, is just to understand uh, basically are, are you trying to, is your, is your goal 
to show managers the value of model-based insights versus sort of an AI type insight or the complementarity of those two things? I think I just got the answer, which is that they should be complementary, but I just wanted to throw that out there. Yeah, no, that's exactly right. So that that's the for my overarching goal here is to show how they are complementary and not truly at odds with each other. Um, and uh, to uh, I think my benefit and uh, the great comments from this session today are going to help make that a lot clearer uh, in a in a future version of this. So as a, as a quick follow up, it, what other work do you know of that has shown that complementary specifically for system dynamics? I'm not sure within the context of system dynamics, there was a whole whole bit of paper around trust and human machine interactions that was from like 2015. I need to find it's a group that was out of Stanford. Unfortunately, one of the lead researchers passed away, so the the the, uh, the the thrust kind of died off. But that was not talking about necessarily trust per se, but how essentially under different circumstances you can have uh, where, whether or not people actually trust the information they are receiving from these systems and if that changes their ordering or not their ordering behavior but the decisions they make based upon if they're being told something is coming from a, an algorithm or not coming from an algorithm um, that's not quite i think where where your question is coming from um, i honestly am not sure about sort of what i consider to be like traditional system and amateur literature where if there's been any conversation around that surely there has been maybe in like a med you know, medical environment uh, there's trust in supply chains between supply chain partners. I'm trying to think of an example with like this idea of algorithms smoothing out order signals and increasing trust between partners. And I'm drawing a bit of a blank for an example of that. Maybe the ARCTAN plays a beer game, mm -hmm. which was this paper back. It's not really a system dynamics paper, but it uses a lot of um references to similar literature where is it uh the top one not martin at all yeah that, that's the one that they play the beer game 30 beer games or something yeah thank you all right cool okay um that's that's all for questions um i'll leave the zoom open for another five minutes if anyone wants to chat with james but I think we can wrap it up. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, James. Thank you. Guys. Great. Nice presentation, James. This is what happens when you leave me alone for like a year under COVID circumstances. I start chipping away at stuff like this. And pretty much my two, this is getting informal, my two major projects over the last year have been chipping away at this off and on and then doing the supply chain model for John that came out of my general exam. And the supply chain model with John took a small pause because of data availability, which now actually next month should change because um, essentially we have a data agreement with um, some folks who I'm really excited about, but it's on an 18 month lag. So it's going to start becoming available, which is awesome. And then this came up because this is the stuff that I get asked questions about in the um, like palms and forms and the rest. So I don't, to be very honest, I understand the difficulty of a lot of this, but I, I don't want to let it go because it's also one of the ones that I get interesting conversations with people in the OM community around. So there's practical meta yeah, I think I came to this session more skeptical. Yeah. Uh, I think the framing around model based and model free, yeah. but the real model based model free, not what you're calling, yeah. which is mm -hmm. not really model based at all. This is this is this that, why I want this, yeah. that actually could work. That is yeah. it is really at the core of behavioral OM mm -hmm. and creating value for the traditional OM community. Yeah by doing behavioral one that's kind of what this yes. does that is it shows how you can leverage the models that are being built in behavioral one to create traditional one value like this, and what I'm, I'm trying not to oversell it in my own head but i keep thinking like in my mind at least and this is going to be of course it's going to be completely wrong and i'll be stuck staring at a python window for six months but the um a lot of i feel like a lot of the learning
James, we lost your mic. James isn't moving either, I think. Maybe someone closed a laptop or something like that. Yeah, I think it may be over. All right. Well, okay. I don't know, but I looks <laughs> like it. I'll give it a couple minutes. It's, I mean, because it was just like getting to the really interesting stuff. I know. It's frustrating. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So, Ed, I understand you are at Texas. Is that right? That is correct. UT Austin. No? Yes. Okay. The UT. Yeah. I am at WP. I'm a PhD student. Oh, very good. I'm glad to hear that. Yeah, um, I'm in the business school, I, but I'm studying system dynamics. Oh, that's good. Sometime I hope to get to chat with you a little more because your questions indicate that we have some overlaps. Yeah, let's do it. I'd like that. Okay. Hi, let's sorry about the WPR sound glitch tomorrow. at the end, everyone. <laughs> oh, that's okay. Right. His computer died, so um, we'll make sure that we'll make sure I have a backup. Um, okay. For next time. All right. Hey, well, hey, did, did we miss anything good from from Hajir? Well, everything Hajir says is useful, but um, yeah, that's right. <laughs> he's just reading his comments to James. So, all right, all right. Um, yeah, hey, thanks for coming by. We'll yeah, be thank you. Every thanks Tuesday. for hosting us. All right, we'll be back. Hey, Bye. Sam.